Good evening, everyone. My name is Andrew Dalton. I'm the executive director of the Adams County Historical Society here in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. Thank you for joining us on the porch of the Historical Society this evening, uh, albeit virtually. Uh, this is Tim Smith, my colleague who most of you know well. Uh, he's a licensed battlefield guide and the historian and collections manager of the Historical Society. Uh, we want to make sure everyone can hear, so if you can't hear and see us and, and everything's good, if you could give us a thumbs up or a comment, we'd really appreciate it just to know we're on the right track. Uh, for those of you who are new to the Historical Society, uh, we are a, a, a tremendous uh, and really large archive here in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. We have over a million historic items of significance to the community and of national significance in many cases. Um, we've been around since 1940 as an or incorporated organization, but we actually have roots to, that date back to the 1880s when uh, uh, the first group got together in Gettysburg. Um, some pretty famous people included, in, like Edward McPherson, um, David Wills, and they formed the Historical Society of Adams County. Uh, so if you count that date, we've been around for, for quite some time, um, and uh, we're still here. We uh, have exciting plans for the future here in the community um, and for the many visitors to Gettysburg. We're excited uh, about what we're going to be announcing later this year. Um, if you haven't already subscribed to our newsletter, I hope you'll, you'll go to our website and sign up. Uh, we'll be putting out a lot of updates in the next few months. Um, some very exciting news we're going to be uh, putting out later this year um, in December. So uh, we're excited to share that with you. Until then, uh, we'll be doing these weekly programs. And uh, tonight's program uh, is a little different from what we've done in the past. Um, we are going to be doing more of a, a question and answer session. So I've already seen some questions um, in the comments here. And I'm looking at my phone if you see me looking down. Uh, just to make sure we get everything. Uh, but Tim uh, is going to be answering a lot of the questions. If I uh, have something to chime in with, I will. Uh, but this is your chance to, to pick the brain of, of Gettysburg's uh, uh, foremost scholar, Tim Smith. Um, and so we already have from the last couple of days about maybe 15 or 20 questions that have been submitted. But please um, let us know um, if you have any other questions uh, in, in the comments and uh, we will do our best to answer them. So I thought we'd start out, you know, just talking briefly about what the Historical Society does and, and uh, you know, how we're kind of qualified through our own experience to answer some of these questions. Um, right now, we're kind of set up as a research library. People will come in and they'll research uh, property history if they own a historic farm in the area or a historic house in the town of Gettysburg. They'll come in and do genealogical research, uh, family history uh, from any period of time dating back to the early 1700s when the first settlers arrived in, in this region of Pennsylvania. Um, and we also have a, a really wonderful repository of materials related to the Battle of Gettysburg and the Civil War um, with a real emphasis on the civilians of Gettysburg. Gettysburg, how they experienced the events of 1863, how they remembered Lincoln's visit, how they remembered the aftermath um, and uh, the commercialization that would take place in the community following the Civil War. Um, so we preserve all of those accounts and, and we're kind of the hub for, for civilian history um, here in Gettysburg. So um, if, if you're into that and you like human interest stories and you like um, learning about the people of our community, I hope you'll like our Facebook page. You can do that as well. Um, on this post-it, if you tap the screen, you should have an option to, to like our page if you haven't already. Um, and you'll see that we post, I think, just about every day, sometimes a couple times a day, uh, really wonderful photographs, um, videos, all kinds of, of great stuff that, that, uh, that uh, is from our collection and that we're hoping to share with you and so that you can learn more about Gettysburg and Adams County. So um, maybe we'll get into the questions. Um, I see a couple coming in now. So um, if we miss your question, please type it again because uh, sometimes they go by a little bit too fast. But uh, um, let's start, I think, with, uh, with some just general county history. And we have one question here from, from our friend uh, Ron Crablin, local doctor, um, about the origin of Gettysburg and how Gettysburg got its name. Was Gettysburg always called Gettysburg, and has the spelling changed? What's the, what's the origin for the actual naming of the town, Tim? Well, one of the things about naming of places in the area is that they aren't necessarily official until there is some kind of official record of a name. In other words, um, you can call a village or a town anything you want until it becomes an incorporated entity. And Gettysburg was incorporated in uh, 1806. So then, it, you know, officially the name was Gettysburg. But uh, on the early deeds of the town, even before the, it was laid out or while it was being laid out, it was called Gettysburg. Now, some other people referred to it, uh, you know, 
um, as Getty's Town. And sometimes you hear that it was originally called Getty's Town and then later it was called Gettysburg. But actually, the people called it Getty's Town were just referring to the fact that it was James Geddes's Town. And so it's Geddes's Town or Geddes Town. And, um, uh, you know, just like uh, Miller's Town was John Miller's Town. But really, initially when it was laid out, it was called Fairfield. So uh, Gettysburg or Gettysburg has always been called uh, Gettysburg. Now, um, I should mention that uh, years ago, I, I've always been conscious of the fact that different people in our community pronounce it slightly differently. Right. Like, and there is a definitely, a, a, um, you know, some people that insist it's Gettysburg and some people like to call it Gettysburg. But um, I had the opportunity on several occasions to speak to direct descendants of James Geddes, the uh, founder of our town. One family in North Carolina, one family in Tennessee. And every time I talk to a descendant, their name is Geddes. So from that, I think it's safe to say that it was probably uh, pronounced Gettysburg originally. And then, you know, people like me who move in from the outside start calling it Gettysburg. That's great. Yeah, so we have a couple questions about early history in the county, which I think is great, um, and, and how far back our records specifically go. We have two questions about the Revolutionary War, um, and, and they're similar questions. One, um, do what records do we have that relate to the, the local soldiers here in Adams County? Of course, this is before Adams County was, was formed in 1800. We're talking about when Adams County was part of York County. Uh, what records do we have in our collection um, on Revolutionary War soldiers? Um, and uh, do we have any kind of rosters? How exactly do we know who the Revolutionary War soldiers were from the county? Yeah, and that's a good question. And um, Pennsylvania uh, does not necessarily have individual rosters of all the units. And in Pennsylvania, uh, they reorganized the way that the Revolutionary units, um, they didn't just start units in the, like in the Civil War and have men stay in that same unit throughout the war a um, you know, soldier could be identified in several different companies of several different regiments as uh, the war went by. They were constantly reorganizing the way the um, various units were um, uh, you know, organized and they were done at the local level for the most part. Uh, one of the problems obviously is that we are York County at that time instead of Adams County and we don't have a lot of records. Now, there is some work that's been done uh, by a York County historian early on on the various types of records you can look at to identify whether someone is a Revolutionary War patriot or not. And the, so, the soldiers who have tombstones in our county, an effort has been made starting, you know, uh, in the 1930s for their graves to be marked uh, as Revolutionary War soldiers. And uh, so, the you know, on um, Veterans Day, flags are on those uh, graves, and you can find Revolutionary War markers on the various stones. Now, early on, um, I should say later on for the uh, Revolutionary War veterans, I guess, but they did collect pensions, and their wives collected pensions, and occasionally their children's collected pensions. And we do have some records here of uh, American Revolutionary soldiers' pensions. I've been to the National Archives. I have looked at individual muster rolls for Pennsylvania units, and they're just few and far between. Here in Adams County, mostly we have the list of officers for various companies and how many men are in those companies, but we don't have a lot of lists of the names of the soldiers that are in those companies, so they just don't exist. That's great. Thanks, Tim. Yeah, so a couple other questions on early things. Um, someone's asking about the Low Dutch Cemetery and some of these earlier communities. Um, is there anything um, you could say to explain to everybody what the Low Dutch community consisted of, where this is in Adams County, well, who these people are? The Low Dutch, as opposed to Pennsylvania Dutch, which are really Pennsylvania Germans, are people from Holland that immigrated to the United States, settled in New York and New Jersey, and then... Uh, some just before the American Revolution, most of them just after the Revolutionary, uh, Revolutionary War, moved into this area and, um, uh, you know, occupied farms um, pretty much uh, just a little east 
uh, of Gettysburg, and their settlement ran from like uh, near uh, two taverns on the Baltimore Turnpike up past uh, Route 30 and uh, where Swift Run Road comes in. There was um, a Dutch Reformed Church, I guess they called it, associated with the, the Low Dutch Settlement. And there are two cemeteries that still exist in our county for these early Dutch um, settlers. And some of these families remained in the county, and you can still find these Low Dutch families today, it, like Brinkerhof or uh, Conover come to mind, just uh, Van Arsdale. These are some of the early Low Dutch families. So we had Low Dutch settlers early on. We had Scotch-Irish immigrants early on. We had Irish immigrants. We had German immigrants. And we had English Quakers that also had moved into the county at an early date. That's great, Tim. Um, another question, um, very specific. So yeah, obviously, these early settlements uh, are you know, scattered across Adams County. There's one um, right where Gettysburg is today um, that's called the, the Marsh Creek Settlement. Um, and uh, we have a lot of sources about that. Uh, one question uh, specifically about one pretty famous family uh, that was part of that early settlement is the Dobbin family. Um, and uh, we have a question here about the, uh, the indentured servant, uh, Dobbin servant. Uh, her name was Becky. And we have a question. Uh, I don't know. This is a very specific question. Yeah. Um, but um, if maybe if, you, if we can't speak specifically to that, maybe we could talk just a little bit about um, the, these early families and, you know, many owned slaves. There were indentured servants. Um, the, the laws in Pennsylvania regarding slavery changed in the, the late 1700s. There was a gradual abolition, um, but there was a lot of servitude and slavery, uh, pure and simple, that continued for, for decades after that. Any, any thoughts on, on this well, question? Well, you know, we do have indentured servants, but, you know, generally as I look back through history, indentured servants were people that lived with a family or a tradesman or worked with them and, uh, you know, worked off uh, either um, an education to become like that trade. Let's say a blacksmith uh, had an indentured servant uh, that lived in his household and helped him with his business and all his, you know, uh, his expenses uh, were paid for because he was getting an education for a certain amount of years. Or I'm sure you know that indentured servants would come in from Europe. Someone here would pay for their passage to the United States in exchange for a number of years working for them. Uh, and uh, then they would be, uh, they would have paid off their obligation and then it would become uh, regular settles. And there was some kind of contractual agreement between them. The problem is, as Andrew mentioned, is we have slavery and the eventual abolition of slavery, which I believe passed in 1780, uh, st stated that everyone who was a slave at that time would continue to be a slave. But after that date, if they had children, that person would remain a slave until they were 26, 20, I think. Six, 27 years old. Yep. Okay. And then they would be free. And oftentimes in the newspaper, these people are referred to as servants or in people's estate papers, there would be terminology that um, someone would will the time left on a servant girl over to someone else. So these are actually, this is different than indentured servant. These are actually um, slaves that are still slaves until they come of age. Right. That's great, Tim. And we should point out, too, the last slave in Adams County died in the 1850s. Now, technically, the state legislature outlawed slavery altogether in the 1840s, but there was a, a slave that was listed on the 1850 census. Um, whether that was legal, I'm not sure if, if <laughs> the, the family actually who owned the slave recognized the fact that that was then illegal to own a slave. But It'll be uh, hard to challenge. Her name was Patience Hack, and, and she lived a very long life, died, I think, in 1858, 57 or 58. So... Um, Thank you. I see people are donating. Just wanted to thank you. There is a donate button on the post tonight. We really, really appreciate your support to be able to continue doing these programs every week. So if you have a chance to hit that button, even five, ten dollars really makes a difference for us. So um, that's great. So we'll move on now. I think there's a few questions related to, to property history. And this is another thing we really enjoy. We like researching old farms and old houses and learning the stories behind um, these structures. Um, so we have one question. And actually, they're kind of related. Um, one question from our good friend Valerie is researching some properties in the New Oxford area. 
um, she said um, she's having a little bit of trouble um, because uh, the properties are, are very rural. Um, and uh, I guess she's asking one property she's researching is rural. One is kind of more urban in the center of a town. Are there, what's the difference between researching like a farm and, a, and a, a town lot? It's definitely much easier to research a house in a town than it is to research a farmhouse on a large property. Right. And, uh, you know, basically you have to do research through the tax records. And depending on what property you're looking at, and you know, we help people do research on properties all the time. It's a hit or miss, uh, you know, topic. Uh, sometimes you find the information right away. Uh, sometimes you don't. Of course, if it's in a town and you can find a newspaper article about a structure being built in that town, then that's great. Of course, first the thing you have to do is you have to take the property and if you research the deeds back and get a chain of ownership to figure out who owns it at different points. And then theoretically, if they, let me give you an example, if the house is in a town, you can look at the owner of that lot. And if he's taxed for $50, it's an empty lot. If he's taxed for like $300, there's a small frame building on it. If suddenly he's taxed for $1,000, they built a brick house on the lot. And again, some of this has to depend on what year we're talking about. But in a, a town lot, you can easily see the jump in the valuation of the property. And you know that indicates that a structure was built. Now, in many cases, structures are built, structures are torn down, other structures built. And so that's a little more difficult to establish. Or a small structure is built, and then there's additions placed onto it as time goes by. The problem with the property research in the county is the uh, value of the property sometimes is divided per acre. Right. So let's say you have a 200 acre farm and it's valued at uh, $50 an acre. Um, and then all of a sudden it jumps up to $70 an acre. Well, then, you know, maybe a, a house has been built on that property. So it's more difficult to figure out the valuation of a farm because it's the valuation of the house is divided up in, in that uh, uh, property value. Now, um, occasionally, you know, you'll get lucky and the tax records will say, new house. But the key is get taking your property, tracing it back to the original owner and trying to establish who owned it for various years. And sometimes you just can't get around looking at the tax record for every single year that is available. Now, the earlier you get back, the more difficult it becomes to figure out when a house is built. And believe me, um, we have many houses in the county that are old, that date from the 1700s, and we just have a vague idea of when they were built. Now, we can tell you when the property was first owned and who was the first owner of the property. And in many cases, there's a small, small log house on the property, and then they built a more substantial brick dwelling and eventually tear down the log house. And they're not always built at the same spot. So, um, again, there's, it depends on what property we're talking about. But in the town of Gettysburg or New Oxford or uh, East Berlin, it is much more likely that we're going to be able to establish a date of construction for a house than if it's, in, um, if it's on a farm somewhere in a Strabian Township or right. something. That's great, Tim. Um, yeah, wonderful questions. We're getting a lot of questions, so we're going to try to keep up with it. Um, I just want to answer one real quick. Somebody's asking if they can find out if there was a house where the armory is now on the battlefield. I believe the answer that is we could probably say definitively there was no house no, uh, where the armory is. There was is no now. house where the armory is. Um, there, was, there was the house on the corner that right. is there, the Schultz house, and then the attached McDonald to Farm. that, yep. there was actually an academy, um, the Oak Ridge Select Academy that was a little south of that, under the next two buildings that are more modern, post-Civil War structures, but there was no building where the armor right. is. Another good, great question. Um, how do we research and find out where renters lived in the town? Yeah, so, well, yeah and let me set this up before ahead. you say, because uh, I think we, we've run into this struggle a lot with the research that we've done. Um, you know, 
on the United States Census in the 1850s, 60s, 70s, and even beyond that, they'll indicate whether or not the person on the census owns or rents their house. For those of you who have done research, you've probably seen it. It's usually an O or an R. If it's an O, you can match that up with deeds and tax lists, and you can see exactly, usually, where the person lives unless they own multiple properties. Um, but if they're listed with an R, it's anybody's guess where they lived. And so, um, and, and what we will typically do, and, and Tim can add to this, because there's multiple ways we've gone about finding this, but when we look at the census, it's, it is almost always, you know, in the order of the census taker walking around the town. So uh, if we know that somebody lives in the first house, then there's a, a, you know, a house where we're not sure, sure who lives there, then another house that we definitely know. We can see in the census sometimes that there's a renter living between those two houses, and it will fit into the gap. Uh, but, you know, obviously that's um, kind of only conjecture, and we usually try to find another source to back it up if we can. But it's very difficult. Well, my answer is going to be very simple. We do not know where <laughs> renters live in the town of Gettysburg, and there are no sources that will tell you where renters live. So here's the, the, the problem with this, obviously. You know, we would like to know where every single person lived in the town at the time of the battle. We have the 1860 census. We have a list of names. Um, uh, you know, we have, we know kind of where the buildings are in town. We can even figure out who owns every single piece of property in the town at the time of the battle. But who rents that property and where the tenants live and which tenants live where is very difficult to establish. It's something that we played around with for many, many years. And let me just throw this at you. I suspect that like 30% of the buildings in town are rental units at the time of the battle. So there's, we have buildings, we have people we don't know where they live. And it's kind of a little puzzle to try to put together where they are. Now maybe there's a civilian account that mentioned where somebody lives or maybe a kid dies in the 1940s and says, hey, I was a little kid in town and I lived and tells you where they lived. Um, but beyond that, it's really difficult. And let me tell you, tell you when you see these maps in like um, uh, Blue and Gray magazine where they show you where people live, <laughs> there's some major guessing going on there. <laughs> We're not fans of guessing. Um, we see it a lot though, don't we? Yeah, um, it's, fun. it's a fun game. Guessing is a, a common problem in history. Um, if you've ever been on Ancestry and you see that somebody's tree goes back to, you know, BC, you Charlemagne. might... Charlemagne, you might want to question the, the sources there. Um, somebody's asking just more broadly, what do you, how do you do property research? Where do you go and what do you use? Um, really, you, you come here to the Adams County Historical Society if you're researching local properties. Of course, we are closed due to the pandemic because we have very, very limited space in our research rooms. Uh, but we do have research requests. There's a process on our website. Uh, we can help you if you're looking at something specific. Um, if, if you can't make it here, we'd recommend looking at some websites. A lot of them you do need a subscription to, like Ancestry.com and Newspapers.com. You can usually type in an address and find some information that way. Um, we also have access to all the deeds here. So you know, if you have a little bit of the history of the property, more, maybe the more modern deeds, we can trace those deeds back. Um, yeah. So that's a great question the from, Adams from Raymond. The County Courthouse has a website, and you have to pay. You have to join the website. You can join. I think you can join for like a week. But you right. pay a fee, and then you can look at deeds online on your website also. Right. But we have the uh, original deeds here for the most part. That's great. So I think now we're going to transition. We're seeing a lot of Civil War Battle of Gettysburg questions, which is wonderful. Um, and so we're, I think we're going we're gonna to switch to that. First, I wanted to, again, thank the, the folks who've donated. It's very generous. And you know, if you, if you do enjoy our videos, I hope you'll, you'll consider hitting the, the donate button. Uh, we uh, really um, you know, continue our work because of uh, all this positive support, um, and it really makes a difference. So thank you. Um, uh, so uh, we have one question from Christine Kelly, who said that uh, she and her daughter really enjoy our programs. We, we really uh, appreciate that. Um, and she's asking um, a very good question. Um, I'll just read it. Um, it seems to me that there, in a lot of other regions, early history can be sketchy. How has the battle contributed to knowledge and understanding of the county's non-battle related history, especially pre-battle history? Um, so, you know, how has the battle sparked a general interest in county history, um, which might not have existed in other regions? And before I turn it over to Tim, I think that's a great question. Um, Tim and I may disagree a little bit. I think that the battle is such a internationally significant event that in a way it really has dwarfed um, the attention that other elements of our local history get. And so there's really an ongoing uh, debate 
uh, I think, w- w- between local residents about how much the Battle of Gettysburg, how much attention we should pay to that, how much of our local story should be devoted when we, you know, write histories or give programs to the Battle of Gettysburg. And uh, some people say, you know, not at all. Some people say it's all we should be focusing on. Um, And uh, I think that that's a false choice. Obviously, we have an incredible 300-year story to tell. Uh, You know, the days of early settlement, we have kidnappings of Mary Jameson and, and other citizens that are nationally famous in scholarship about the French and Indian War. Then we have Thaddeus Stevens starting his legal career here in Gettysburg, a, you know, a, a very nationally significant figure tied to the town. We have Francis Scott Key as a member of the bar in Adams County. Um, and then, of course, we have the Battle of Gettysburg, Lincoln's Address, and uh, after that we have Dwight D. Eisenhower, you know, having his home here and, and starting America's first tank camp uh, in Gettysburg. So, you know, to answer that question, you know, I think to an extent, the battle and the visitation we get over that has really dwarfed the rest of the story, and we hope to bring a lot more of, of, of the other elements of our local history to you um, at our new, um, you know, in, in our plans for the future. Well, I think, uh, you know, I guess it's a double-edged sword. So you have that where maybe the battle tends to overshadow some of the other, uh, what may have been, without the battle, uh, nationally historic events that we would be known for. Uh, on the one hand, but there's also an opportunity here for us that the attention that the Battle of Gettysburg brings allows us to uh, highlight some of our history that might not otherwise be highlighted. And um, uh, for instance, you know, uh, we did, uh, Andrew and I wrote uh, Adams County Historical Society Journal on the history of Fairfield. And that thing has sold outside of the market of Fairfield because we decided that we would tell the story and the history of Fairfield uh, from the time of the Civil War back to its early origins. And what I like to do, whether it be the town or the county or Fairfield, Gettysburg or Fairfield, is use 1863 as sort of a watershed. Okay, we know a lot about the battle. We know a lot about the civilians that lived during the battle because they wrote about that event. We know where people live. We have a better idea of knowing where they live because the battle occurred here and we have all these counts relating to it. So we can use 1863 as a starting point to know who owned all the properties. And then from that, we can work backwards for a more in-depth history. So if we didn't have that watershed or that uh, place to start from, it would be much more difficult in doing uh, county research. So I think we tend to use the battle as sort of a, um, okay, 1863, uh, and then we have history leading up to that event and history leading uh, past that event. But, uh, you know, we get a lot of visitors that come here because they're interested in 1863 and really not interested in any other stuff. Right, right. Yeah, and we, we, we're working to, to try to make it more appealing, you know, the, the rest of the history. I think Gettysburg is such a famous community, um, not just for its Civil War history, but for things like Eisenhower and Thaddeus Stevens and, and uh, you know, the many, many, many visits by prominent Americans and presidents to, to Gettysburg over the years. Um, these are all things that I think have pretty broad appeal, and we're excited to, to you know, provide more context, like Tim said, on the you know, be, be on both sides of the watershed moment of our, our county history, which obviously is the Battle of Gettysburg. And, you know, for the people who do think, you know, we should not be doing as much of that, you know, to counter the effect of it dwarfing, you know, I would just point out what other county would ignore or diminish the single most important thing that happened in that county. You know, you go to, um, you know, Johnstown, and it's all about the Johnstown flood because that's really the big thing that they're known for there. Um, and it's the same thing here. It's just that Gettysburg is so much bigger than, than really, you know, anything else. I'm, other than big cities like Philadelphia and Washington, I, I don't know if there's anybody who could really compete with, with the county history that we have here. Um, so that's something that we're fortunate for. And I, we have a lot of potential to grow um, and, and present some more of this, uh, uh, this history on both sides of the, the Civil War period. Um, so now we have a lot of questions I, I'm seeing about battlefield farms, which is obviously Tim's specialty. Um, and civilians and civilian accounts. So I'll try to get through these, and we'll try to do them as quickly as we can because there, there are really quite a few questions I'll make my here. Answers quick. <laughs> um, I want to start with one that just came in, so I don't miss it. Um, 
Did President Eisenhower build their house, or did he purchase an already existing house and barn? He did purchase an existing Civil War farm that was used as a hospital during the battle, uh, but he tore down, he and Mamie tore down a portion of it, rebuilt it, and then added on a, a second smaller addition to the house. But I think, what would you say, maybe a third of the house is original, and it's pretty old. Yeah. I think late 1700s. I don't know much about the family that lived there at yeah. the time. Yeah, um, I don't think we have a about lot it. about it, but um, it is a very, very old uh, Civil War house. I think if you're looking at it, if I'm not mistaken, um, it's the middle section uh, that's old. You can tell if you look at the brick. Um, so several farms people are asking about. One is the George Weikert farm. Um, Tim, I'm sure you know the difference between the five or six Weikert farms yeah, on the battlefield. Weikert's <laughs> living Gettysburg at the time. Um, there's a question about that farm in particular, and there's uh, evidently a, a date stone on it that says 1794. The barn. On the barn. In the barn, there's a date stone, yes. Right. Is there anything, I think we just have a question more broadly about what, who, well, that, who that was and what's the significance no, I don't, of that farm. Uh, uh, you know, it's funny, off the top of my head, I do not, uh, the Weikerts, I don't think, purchased that farm until the 1850s. Okay. Um, so, uh, you know, I don't remember who uh, originally uh, owned that farm. It's funny, a lot of my doing, I don't know that original <laughs> owner off the top of my head. Yeah, that's all right. Um, another question just came in, kind of relevant to this. Were there any taverns that were open during the battle in the town? Yes, uh, the Globe Inn, I think most famously, and yeah. the Eagle Hotel. Um, yeah. These are these are pretty famous taverns. The Eagle Hotel sat where the Seven Eleven is at the corner of Washington yeah. and Chambersburg Street. The Globe Inn is on York Street, um, just a few houses in. A anything else you can think of? I guess the Wagon Hotel. Well, the Wagon Hotel is occupied by Union sharpshooters during the battle. Um, you know, the uh, on the first on the evening of the June thirtieth, the morning of the first day, uh, obviously on Chambersburg Street, the Eagle Hotel is op occupied by General Buford and his staff and you know, during throughout the battle, the Globe Inn is occupied by Confederate soldiers who, um, uh, you know, pay according to the, hotel, the tavern owner in cash uh, for all their meals that they take there while they're visiting. So, yes, they continue to be open. Yeah, that's great. Um, so another question. Um, did General Meade move his headquarters to the Cassett farm? And it's a question from, okay. and I, I'm, I don't know if I'm saying the name, is it Cassett or Cassatt? Cassatt, yeah. Cassatt. We have a question. It's from Jim Cassatt. So I, I, I'm oh, sure good. that Jim uh, is probably related. Oh, so the guy who uh, lived there <laughs> at the time of the battle, Solomon Cassatt. And basically this farm no longer stands, but there is a house standing near the location. I think they might, the park might call it um, the Hoffman house at the moment, uh, off the top of my head. But basically... We're talking about a house that stood down the Tawny Town Road, um, south of Meade's headquarters, uh, which was the Leicester House. So uh, on the evening of July 1st, General Meade placed his headquarters at the Leicester House. And then during the heavy bombardment on July 3rd that preceded Pickett's Charge, he moved his headquarters uh, to a location near the Baltimore Pike, near Slocum's headquarters, and then spent the night in a piece of woods. And if you know this area, we're talking about there's a large uh, piece of woods that's between the Baltimore Pike and Powers Hill and the Cassatt Farm and the Tawny Town Road and the Granite Schoolhouse. So in various accounts, he spends the night in Cassatt's Woods or at Granite Schoolhouse or on Powers Hill. And I think it's on the morning of July 4th when one of our local citizens, uh, George Arnold, uh, rides uh, south of the town, alerts um, uh, General Meade that the Union, the Southern Army, is pulling out of town on the morning of July 4th. Uh, I think in that, that account might say that he finds Meade in Cassatt Woods. So um, Solomon Cassatt. And Solomon Cassatt had a son, I think, uh, J. Jefferson Cassatt who was in the 87th Pennsylvania. That's right. I think we have his photograph in our collection, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, a, a couple other questions, kind of rapid fire. Um, uh, I can answer this first one. Does the woods where General Reynolds died look the same as it did in July, on July 1st, 1863? I think for the most part it does. I think all woodlots around here have a lot more undergrowth than they did at the time of the battle, so you probably would have been able to see a lot further. This is the woodlot owned by the farmer John Herbst uh, along Willoughby's Run west of Gettysburg. Uh, John Herbst and his family lived in the Herbst Farm, which is privately owned just a little bit south of the woods. As most of you know, General John Reynolds is killed around a little after 10 a.m. on the morning of July 1st um, at the uh, eastern edge of this woodlot. But would you agree, Tim, it's pretty I, much... Yeah, I would just say that most of the woodlots around our battlefield are based upon how they appear on the G.K. Warren map of the battlefield, which was surveyed. 
1868 and in 1869. So we're talking about this is the appearance of this woodlot on a map five or six years after the battle. And without other evidence, the park usually uh, restores them to the appearance on, on that particular map. So it's our best guess of what the woodlot looked like. That's great. Yeah, a few other farm-related questions. Someone asking about the history of the Samuel Johns farm on Marsh Creek. Uh, oh. This is a, a farm not far from where we're sitting, actually, yeah. um, uh, west of, of Gettysburg uh, along the Fairfield Road. Do, I don't remember anything, anything specific well, I think, on uh, that. Are we talking about the, the Samuel Johns farm? I think, um, uh, is that the one um, that is a hole in the ground near Willoughby's Run? Yeah. Um, I th and it's right. on, um, it would be on a, her tavern road. Uh, okay, right. near yeah. the lane that goes back to the Pitcher Farm. And I have been to that location, and it is a hole in the ground. So um, That's I, great. I, I, I could look on the map. Yeah, sure we might have to check more about. on that one. Um, that's the one that we're talking about. Yeah. Uh, it's just a hole in the ground. Here's a great question for Tim. Who occupied the home that became Lee's headquarters during the Battle of Gettysburg? Uh, Mary Thompson. <laughs> and if you don't know, Tim has written a book about the yeah. Mary Thompson house, yeah. the story of Lee's headquarters. A 69-year-old widow who had eight children, but they had grown and moved away. Now, it is a duplex, and perhaps somebody lived in the other side of the house, but or perhaps it was vacant at the time, but we do not have the owner or the tenant at the other side of the, the house, but we do know it's Mary mm -hmm. Thompson. Another question, uh, Willoughby Run Road, um, was, uh, was it used by Biddle's Brigade to reach the field on July 1st? And why, uh, if that's true, is it not labeled on the 1858 Adams County wall map? So uh, a little background here, Willoughby Run Road, if you don't know, is out the Fairfield Road west of Gettysburg. Um, it leads south, uh, kind of toward behind what would become the Confederate lines, back towards uh, the Emmitsburg Road. Um, Willoughby Run Road is used by elements of the Union Army to reach the field on July 1st. Um, really, uh, just the brigade of Chapman Biddle, which took a different route, kind of, I think, to avoid the traffic jam that was forming on the way into town. Um, Biddle's brigade ended up on McPherson's Ridge, but they arrived at the edge uh, of the battlefield on the Fairfield Road, uh, kind of precariously sitting on the Confederate right flank. Um, I actually wrote about that a little bit in my book about the Harmon Farm. They would cross over the fields uh, west of Gettysburg and arrived on McPherson's Ridge. Um, I think the answer to that question is that, um, and Tim and I discussed this a bit earlier, uh, the 1858 map it really doesn't show every road. Um, there's a lot of farm paths and, and smaller lanes that are not shown. I should point out Willoughby Run Road, um, although not exactly aligned how it is today, is shown on the Warren map, which we use for a lot of research on the battlefield, and that was drawn in the late 1860s, 1868 into 1869. Um, so that's a great question. Another one, um, where were the supply trains of both armies during the battle? Well, I mean, obviously the Union supply uh, trains are on the Tony Town Road or the Baltimore Turnpike. So, uh, and, uh, you know, the 5th Army Corps had been switched over from the Hanover Road to the Baltimore Turnpike. So just behind the lines of battle. The Southerners, it's much more difficult because we're talking about all the things that they gathered up from all the farms and mills and while they were in Pennsylvania. So some of them came in from the east, but slowly they were moved around to the west and the wagon trains of the Southerners either left via the Chambersburg Pike or uh, the Fairfield Road uh, to get out of this area afterwards. But, um, you know, during the battle, I'd imagine supply line, the trains would just, you know, be back along these major roads. Uh, there's a great drawing on, um, I think it was done on July 4th by a um, uh, Union uh, war correspondent. I think it's a, a Wode sketch, but he is uh, near Granite Schoolhouse Road in the Baltimore Pike, and he draws some of the wagons uh, sitting uh, near Powers Hill. Uh, behind the lines. That's great. Um, another question uh, specific to civilians. What was on the south side of the Garlock House on Baltimore Street in 1863? Was it an empty lot or did it belong to the Garlock? So the Garlock House yeah. is on the uh, on the west side of Baltimore Street, yeah. um, on I, you know, probably the third block. It's yeah. down the hill. Yeah. Um, if you're not familiar with the story of the Garlock family, uh, a Union general, uh, Schimmelfenig, sought refuge in the the back building. I guess it was kind of the outhouse of mm -hmm. the of the the and uh, was uh, fed by and and yeah. given supplies in the woodshed. In the woodshed. Um, it was given uh, food and water from the family from Anna Garlock and her family. Um, so we're talking about just south of that lot. So um, there was an alley there, 
in the alley shows, I think uh, it's on uh, on the Warren map or uh, possibly the 1850 map of the town. But there was an alley that came through, uh, and it's probably the alley that comes through from Washington Street. And it appears at the time of the battle that alley continued across into uh, the garlic property and came out on Baltimore Street. So the That's alley great. came all the way through. Good. Now um, there's a gap. I'm going to answer a couple real quick. Do do they still find relics on the Gettysburg battlefield? Yes. Sure. The park uh, still receives probably a handful. People turn them in. I think sometimes people feel guilty for keeping them and then mail them back. Um, although that's true with rocks, I think, as well. Um, uh, but uh, relics are still being found on the battlefield, absolutely, especially on private property where um, we, w there is some metal detecting and, and that type of thing. Of course, we should point out it is illegal to metal detect on the battlefield. It's government land, um, but there are private properties where metal detecting um, takes place, and they still find quite a bit of relics, I would say. And, and think about this. Let's say, let's say that there's 150,000 soldiers in a the battle. There's 160 or so. And let's say each soldier fired like 50 rounds, which seems reasonable. Uh, that would be 7.5 million. So I, I think a conservative estimate is 8 million bullets on the battlefield. There are still bullets out there. <laughs> And likely but remains as well. Um, yeah. uh, so um, another quick question. Is it true they hung Confederate deserters at Sachs Covered Bridge? That Absolutely is... <laughs> not. That's no what it... <laughs> truth whatsoever. Is that a ghost story? I yeah. Think? yeah. It's a ghost story that um, was started by, in a, in a it might, I don't know if it's in one of his books, but it started in a video that was um, done by uh, one of the, uh, Haunted Gettysburg it was called. And um, they made up this story about, uh, Confederates being hung at the bridge, and then of course someone films them, you know, hanging at the bridge, and right. um, and then they have a story about it. What's really interesting about the story is, though, a lot of the ghost stories are told around town, and a lot of times people come and ask us about a story told here and there in the book. In this particular instance, um, you know, most people who talk about it, you know, said, "Oh, you know, there's this ghost story," and the ghost story is discounted, but people still cling to the idea that the ghost story is based on some <laughs> true story about soldiers being hung at the bridge, and it is absolutely not. Right. No truth at all. Right. Very good. Um, wonderful comments here. Um, uh, just a couple more questions. Uh, we have a descendant of the Rosensteel family. Uh -huh. uh, on and they're asking about right. the Rosensteels. Of course, the Rosensteels are famous for establishing a museum in Gettysburg that would later become the visitor center for the Park Service or for the um, uh -huh. yeah for the Park Service uh, that was torn down and replaced by the current visitor center. Uh, this person's asking though, uh, his ancestors, where did they live during the battle? Where did the Rosensteels live? Well, I think um, the, you know, there's several Rosensteel families, and boy, I wish I would have uh, uh, looked into the Rosensteel Rosen genealogy a little bit, but. Uh, the Rosensteels, for the most part, lived in Emmitsburg, Maryland. But if you look on the Warren map of the battlefield, there's a Rosensteel that lives on Wolf's Hill. Um, so it would be uh, north of the Hanover Road, or south of the Hanover Road, I'm sorry. Uh, not far south from, like, um, uh, along where 15 is, near south of Granite Hill, uh, not Granite Hill, um, Drummer Boy. Drummer Boy campground there? Drummer Boy. I think so. But, yeah. Um, uh, yeah, on top of the hill, there's a Rosensteel family uh, shown at the time of the battle. But I think the Rosensteels that formed the museum on Round Top in 1886 came from the Emmitsburg area. And, you know, supposedly John H. Rosensteel actually was on the battlefield, like on July 6th or July 7th, gathering up artifacts that he would later, uh, you know, use in his initial museum. Wow, that's amazing. Yeah, we have, and we have a lot of collections like that that were picked up just within days of the battle, which is remarkable. Um, a, a few other great questions. Um, the Hummelbaugh Farm. Um, mm -hmm. Is there any civilian account? What, do we know anything about the, the family that lived there at the time uh, of the Jacob battle? Jacob Hummelbaugh lived there. Um, I, I believe uh, his wife had died. His son was in the Union Army. He was in Company B, 138th Pennsylvania Volunteers, and uh, he lost his arm uh, in the wilderness, I believe. And afterwards... Uh, he came back, and he lived at the farm for many years afterwards. But Jacob lived there at the time of the battle. He had a maid that lived there who I believe he'd later marry. Um, I don't remember if they married before or after the battle. And then she had a, a child that lived there, and he probably had a, 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 a several other children that lived there. Of course, that farm is famous because um, uh, Barksdale, uh, General Williams Barksdale, died at that location. 
Good. A couple more questions. I, someone's mentioning Iverson Pitts is another area of ghost, uh, lots of ghost you stories. Know, I, always, <laughs> uh, I always try to, you know, because I try to be fair to the ghost stories. <laughs> but uh, Iverson's uh, Pitts, the story of that um, really uh, comes from um, um, Walter Clark's North Carolina regiments, in which a veteran of, uh, I believe it's the 12th, North Carolina comes back and talks about how you can see the outline of the pits and tells a story that um, uh, locals uh, refuse to plow the field there because it moans when they try to plow it. And then I sometimes make uh, the point that that is the only ghost story I had ever heard about the battlefield when I was younger. Wow. Yeah, great questions. I'll try to answer some quickly. Uh, I promise we'll try to answer every single question, even if we go a little bit over. Um, and uh, someone's asking, how does the uh, how does Adams County government work with the national park? Do they have any authority over the park area? I think the answer really is no. I'm not sure exactly what the relationship is. The park is owned by the federal government, um, so the federal government has jurisdiction over the park. Um, the park sets its boundary, which is established by an act of Congress, although that can be a little bit murky sometimes. Um, but, and there are uh, roads yeah. that go through the park that are right, you know, administered by uh, the local uh, municipalities. Right. And then um, also there is an advisory committee, the Gettysburg Advisory Committee, and it's made up of uh, county officials and town officials, and they have regular meetings to talk about different things in the park, like the speed limit in the park or, uh, you know, how park projects will affect the community around it. Um, I always think of the thing that always comes to my mind when you talk about the park in the community is that, um, you know, uh, usually a town has like a system of shortcuts around it where the locals know how to get around the traffic in the town by using the shortcuts. But unfortunately for us, the battlefield completely surrounds the town, and the battlefield is the shortcut around the right, town. Right. And um, it, it's yep. fascinating. And you can get respect. stuck. I, I, I have a lead foot, so we, you, can, you can always get you know, a little irritated sometimes, I think, when you're behind a, a, yeah. a licensed guide driving and pointing and the car swerves as the yeah, point really goes out slow. the window. Yeah, we like to do that. <laughs> um, great questions. There's a lot of questions. How do you buy my book? Wonderful question. Uh, through our website, you can buy. It's called Beyond the Run. Um, someone's saying there are no ghosts in Gettysburg. They know that that's your slogan. Um, when was the last wounded soldier, Union or Confederate, evacuated from Gettysburg after the battle? Interesting. I guess it depends on how you qualify that. But obviously, after the battle, there were wounded everywhere. And then as the weeks went on, they tried to move the wounded to designated areas, you know, churches, the Lutheran Seminary. And then eventually they established Camp Letterman General Hospital in the fields east of the town. And they moved the wounded soldiers into that facility. At the same time, as soon as possible, they are transporting men out by train to other hospitals in major cities, such as Baltimore or Harrisburg or Philadelphia. And I think the last of the wounded soldiers are moved out of Camp Letterman in November of 1863, just shortly before the Gettysburg Address. But undoubtedly, uh, wounded soldiers that were being cared for in private homes remained in the area even beyond that. So again, it right. depends how you qualify. Yeah. But basically, November of 1863. Right. And I'm, I might add, too, there is a Confederate soldier who's wounded in the Battle of Gettysburg who ends up deserting and marries a local girl here in Adams County and stays here for the rest of his life. So maybe he's the Yeah, the again, last it depends soldier. on how you qualify. It really does. <laughs> a couple quick questions. Any photos of the Granite Schoolhouse? Yes. And, and I think we put that up on our website. Maybe we'll get um, uh, Clinton or... Um, you know, guru our board chair. on uh, <laughs> Facebook yes. to uh, repost it for you. But right. yes, we do have a nice photograph of kids at Granite Schoolhouse, but the photograph is from uh, the 1880s. Great. Question, how do we get more young people interested in Gettysburg history? Oh, what a wonderful question. Um, that's a, you know, we're doing the best we can. I think uh, a lot of young people really enjoy local history. I think uh, if you can make it personal, I think everything's becoming more personal and more customized. And whether you think that's good or bad, I'll leave that to you. But I think younger people enjoy things that are customized to them. So, you know, the more we can make history about your life and your family and your community, I think that's the way that we, we do it. And that's what we try to do a lot here at the Historical Society. Um, I'm going to try to see if we get everything. How long did the Wade family occupy the home where Jenny's sister lived um, at with her baby? 
That's a good uh, question. We don't really know when uh, Jenny's sister uh, started renting the um, house. It was the house was owned by John Hauk, who lived on Baltimore Street, and he owned about uh, twelve rental properties around the town. He also owned the rock formation known as Devil's Den at the time of the battle. Uh, but I, if you, I think that uh, Georgia and her husband started to rent the house, the half uh, house, in um, the spring of, um, or summer of 1862, um, when, just after Georgia um, was married. So they probably owned, uh, lived in the house for a year. But it, it's possible that they moved in the spring of uh, 1863. Of all the stuff we have, I don't think I have anything where she gives the date that they started to rent a house. All right, good. A, a great question from Jim. How much did the government do in response to the recovery of the battle during the aftermath of the battle? Um, and I, I, you know, I would say very little. Um, you yeah. know, the, the local citizens filed claims for damages done to their property, many uh, you know, listing the, the, the contents of their house being destroyed, their crops being trampled, their fences burned, um, and really very little if anyone received any compensation for their losses. Yeah, immediately after the battle, there were crews that were here that were uh, run by uh, the federal government or the uh, army provost marshal or uh, detachments that were sent as part of the department of the Susquehanna. So there were different people that were in charge of the immediate aftermath and recovery effort. But once those uh, soldiers moved on, there was not much interaction with the federal government and the citizens and um, you know the recovery efforts and uh, until obviously um, the the federal government took over the GBMA from the veterans and started the National Military Park. Great, um, yeah, wonderful questions. We really appreciate. Um, what happened to Mrs. Thorne's husband from Evergreen Cemetery? So Peter Thorne, sorry, we're a little bit scattershot with the questions, but we want to make sure we answer as many as we can. Uh, obviously, the Thorns occupy the Evergreen Cemetery Gatehouse, a very famous landmark on the Gettysburg Battlefield. Peter and Elizabeth Thorne, she's pregnant at the time of the battle, ends up burying 80-some uh, Union 90 soldiers, some. 90 some Union soldiers in the Evergreen Cemetery. Um, what happened to her husband, Peter? Um, so they're probably asking this because he's not mentioned her account. Peter Thorne is in Company B, 138th Pennsylvania Volunteer Infantry during the battle. And uh, he's stationed at Maryland Heights uh, on, near Harpers Ferry. And um, uh, he does return after the battle. He does continue to be uh, the Evergreen Cemetery uh, gatekeeper. And off the top of my head, I believe he died in 1906. And he's buried in Evergreen Cemetery next to his wife. That's wonderful. Thank you, guys. So many people saying how much they're enjoying the program. We've got a few more minutes left. Uh, if you have a chance before you sign off to hit the donate button, we really do appreciate your support. Um, I'll go through a few of these questions quick here. Could there be more undiscovered burial maps from other battlefields after the Antietam burial map was just discovered? Somebody, wonderful. somebody asked this question of us. <laughs> uh, I forget exactly what forum we were in, and it caught us by surprise. And then I think we both said yes. But after giving it a little bit of thought, we came to the conclusion, no, unless we're talking about monocacy, because here's the key that we realized. It took us a while to think about this, but these maps were drawn during the Civil War. Right. So Gettysburg and Antietam are in the north where he has access to these sites. Getting to a site in right. 1864, especially right. early 1864, in Virginia is out of the question. Right. Yeah, that's a very good point. I think Manassas, we, we debate whether that might yeah. be possible as well. Monocacy would be very possible. Um, if, if those maps come to light, we'd be very excited. <laughs> of course, for those of you who don't know, Tim and I kind of stumbled accidentally upon the, the big map of Antietam, of the burials at the Antietam battlefield, done by uh, Simon G. Elliott, who created the famous Elliott map of Gettysburg. Um, lots of questions. We, we'll do our best here. Um, and uh, were Confederate wounded placed in the same hospitals as w Union wounded? Yes. In many cases, the hospitals were, uh, you know, there were Union and Confederate people, although there were some hospitals that were heavier on one side or the other, depending on where the hospital was located. Um, does Tim still tend to do uh, the fire in the beer garden on the weekends at the Farnsworth house? There's a question. <laughs> I don't know exactly uh, what that yeah, means. I do tend to fire <laughs> yes. at the beer garden, yes. <laughs> um, 
Great not, questions. We don't have the fire there at the moment. You have to wait till the fall. <laughs> Current status of Red Patch. It's a house built by General um, uh, Collis. What's his first name? Jeez. Charles. Uh, Charles Collis, a prominent Civil War general, built a house here after the Civil War, used it as a summer house. It's being renovated by our good friends. Uh, they're doing a wonderful job with it. Um, we hope you'll, you'll get to see it. Um, how can you get Tim's book on uh, Lee's headquarters? It, I think Americana Souvenirs, their website, is probably the best place. I think we usually sell some here. I'm not sure if we have any left in stock at the moment. Um, another question, how many civilian casualties were there at, at Gettysburg? Well, I think it depends upon how you count. Obviously, Jenny Wade was the only civilian to be killed during the fighting as a direct result of the fighting. So we have one person killed. But uh, depending on the, how you count, there's eight civilians that are wounded during the fighting. Uh, you know, John Burns would be a good example. I guess it depends if we count uh, Charles Weekly from Emmitsburg that joined along with the 12th Massachusetts on uh, the first day of the battle, or uh, Lizzie Waltz, who was a female that was wounded in the fight at Hanover on uh, June 30th, if you want to say the larger uh, picture of the uh, Gettysburg campaign. But um, we also have 10 civilians that were taken prisoner by Lee's army for various reasons. Uh, wandering into the picket line at an inopportune time and being arrested. And they were actually taken, these uh, prisoners, down to Virginia, put in prison and stayed there for, uh, you know, one of them or a few of them for uh, a couple of years until near the end of the war. And then, you know, there are definitely civilians that die as a direct result of the battle, but after the battle, such as uh, a little boy in town, um, uh, Edward McPherson Woods, uh, his brother finds a musket after the battle, picks it up and shoots and kills his brother. And I think he's like three years old. Um, uh, there are civilians that are killed by unexploded ordnance that's left on the battlefield in the weeks and months and years after the battle. So, again, it depends on how you qualify these right. things. And disease. Did we, and, of yeah. course, disease. There are definitely people that die as a direct result of the battle because of contaminated water in their well. There's an increase in deaths by waterborne diseases immediately after the battle. So I would say that civilian casualties, depending on how you want to count it or not count it, it's got to be something like 20 or 30 in the immediate aftermath right. of the battle. Right. A couple more Gettysburg um, questions. You mentioned that Lee's headquarters was a duplex, which means two families yes. could have lived there. We, we don't know, I guess, during the battle if there's anyone else That's living right. there, uh, but the house was built as a duplex, as were a couple other houses, like yeah. the Jenny Wade house. Jenny um, Wade house, a duplex. Yep. Um, a couple rapid-fire questions. Uh, the famous Harvest of Death series of photographs mm -hmm. of the Gettysburg battlefield. Um, has there been any progress in determining where this mystery series of photos of dead bodies was taken? on yeah, the battlefield. Uh, the best place to keep checking for something like that is the Center for Civil War Photography that has a website and they keep updated on the latest photographic discoveries. It's interesting they did find a new photograph of Civil War dead and they're not sure exactly what battlefield or what action the photograph is from, uh, not Gettysburg, but uh, I don't think there's been any real progress made in locating the uh, lo uh, finding location of the harvest of death beyond what has already been out there for years. Right. Another question, not Civil War related, but is there any military activity in Adams County during uh, earlier wars, uh, like the Revolution, the French and Indian War? Uh, well, French and Indian War, obviously there were uh, raids into this area. In the, uh, you know, we're talking about right. in the 1750s by uh, French soldiers and their uh, Iroquois or Delaware um, um, uh, you know, I should say Shawnee, a Delaware uh, uh, partners, and there are several raids. But uh, no, during the revolution, there was no uh, skirmishes or actions in the area. Um, and although it's not too far east of here, and none in uh, the War of 1812. So, you know, what I always like to point out is the Battle of Gettysburg for the civilians that live here, this is their first, um, you know, interaction with uh, fighting uh, in this area, although Jeb Stuart raided through the area in 1862. That's great. Yeah, a wonderful questions. Just a couple more, and then we'll sign off. Where I, I, I promise you, we're, we're going to try to answer every single one we get. 
Um, the Moving to a, kind of a different topic. Actually, well, let me stick with one more t- related to the battle. Um, someone's asking about the how dead soldiers were removed from the battlefield. Were they shipped to other cities? Um, a specific question here we have is about Philadelphia. Uh, if there were soldiers from, let's say, Philadelphia or New York, um, and they wanted to move the bodies back, was there a concerted effort to ship them? Mm-hmm. Now, I would say to that, for the Union dead, for the most part, they stay here and are buried in the National Cemetery. But... You know, the real movement of the dead um, uh, is with Confederate bodies that are taken to cemeteries throughout the South, like Atlanta, Georgia, Savannah, Georgia, Hollywood Cemetery in Richmond, Virginia. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, a couple things about it. First of all, officers are generally always, the bodies are taken care of and are always shipped back home and they're buried in the hometown cemeteries. If you go to the Soldiers National Cemetery, there's some... 3,500 Union soldiers from the Battle of Gettysburg buried there, and there are very few officers. Most of them are enlisted men. About half of them are in unknown graves. You know, even amongst the Northern soldiers, half of them are in unknown graves. I think there's uh, two lieutenant colonels off the top of my head, a handful of um, captains and majors. But So officers are moved home. But Governor Curtin had um, had to, and I don't know if it's a, a act passed by the state legislature. They had come with this idea that prior to the battle, they were going to move any soldier who was killed in battle to their hometown at the expense of the state of Pennsylvania. And Governor came, Curtin came here after the battle, saw the large amount of Pennsylvania dead, and thought, "Why don't we just buy a piece of ground near Gettysburg and bury all the Pennsylvania dead in that?" A plot of land. And that was really the inception of the idea that led to the Soldiers National Cemetery. Now, the Southerners obviously were buried all over the battlefield, mostly in trenches and pits and unknown graves. And it wasn't until like eight years later that ladies of the South organized groups, got some money together, um, uh, hired some local people, and uh, a lot of those bodies were removed to southern cemeteries in large boxes in which there were multiple bodies placed in the boxes. And for the most part, those bodies were unknown and moved to unknown graves, unknown locations and cemeteries in the south. That's great. We have a couple more, uh, one, I think really just one more Battle of Gettysburg question, and then we'll do a couple post-battle questions, post-Civil War, and then uh, we'll sign off. Um, we have a, a relative of the um, of the, the family that owned the brickyard on Coster Avenue, I think the Kuhn family, yeah. um, cool. was wondering if you could talk for a second just about um, the, the Kuhn family and what that brickyard was all about. We're talking about along Stratton Street on the north edge of Gettysburg, what is now called Brickyard Lane. Specifically, the question is... Um, um, how much of that original property does the Park Service own today? Well, the Park Service just owns a slice of ground uh, where the monuments are uh, um, along the end of, um, is it uh, Stevens Street? Yep. At the end yep. of Stevens Street, so. I believe, mm-hmm. named after Thaddeus Stevens, comes off of Carlisle Street, goes over across Strand Street. And uh, they own a piece of land near where the brick yard, the kilns were located. John Kuhn... Um, I, uh, he moved into the town, I believe, in the 1840s. That Kuhn house is built in, along Stratton Street in, uh, I think, 1859, off the top of my head. He lived there with his wife and children. I believe the house next to it was actually built by his brother. We did some research on him at some point. Francis Kuhn, um, some of the uh, children we married and remained in the town and lived here for any, many years. Uh, North Stratton Street, extending from the railroad out to the Harrisburg Road, had been laid out in the 1840s. And at the time of the battle, there were three or four houses along that street. I think three houses on the side where the Coon House was in the brickyard. And then on the other side of the street, uh, the Barbahans lived out. And these buildings were damaged during the battle. The Coon House has an artillery shell sticking out of it. The Barbahan House has an artillery shell sticking out of it. So you can actually still see visual battle damage on these buildings. Right, and Tim's article um, on all of the battle damage in the town of Gettysburg is available on our website. It's in uh, Adams County History, our annual journal, Volume 2. It's got a green cover. There's a whole article in there with every single artillery shell that's lodged in a house still in the town of Gettysburg. How many are there still today? Nine. Okay, wonderful. Yeah, a couple more questions. Um, we, we still have a little bit of time, so we will we'll keep going. Um, let's see here. 
Okay. Um, conservative estimate of how many bodies are still buried on the battlefield. Well, that's a good question. I mean, that, that's a question we get all the time on our tours. And the biggest problem with the answer to this question is we don't know how many men were killed during the battle. So we have a vague idea of how many people were buried on the battlefield afterwards. And if you think about it just for a second, the major issue is the fact that people didn't die right away. There are men killed in the battle, but there are men who die a week later or a month later, and they die in a hospital in Harrisburg or they die in York. So, so uh, a lot of these people did not die here, and yet they're on the list as dying. And so, you know, should we, how do we count? We don't know how many men. Then also many units like Armistead's brigade reports 88 men killed, but 643 are missing. <laughs> Undoubtedly, some of those missing are dead and are buried on the field, and some of them uh, were captured or were wounded and survived the war, and they're not buried on the field. So it's an inexact guess because we don't know how many, what the number is to start with of men who are buried on the field. And then so we know how many bodies were moved uh, Confederate bodies were moved afterwards and how many northern bodies are moved afterwards. So I'm going to say that the difference between the number of people that we know where they're buried today and number of people that we suspect were killed in the battle is around a thousand. So I think it's safe to say that there are hundreds of bodies still buried around Gettysburg on the battlefield. And the high number would be a thousand, but it's probably in the hundreds. Now, whether it's 200 or 500 or 700, I don't know. We could, right. somebody needs to write an right. article about this. Yeah, and the last <laughs> body to be discovered was in 1996 on the first day's battlefield yeah. in the railroad cut. I, I don't think they were able to determine much more than that it was the remains I, I, of yeah, a soldier. There, there's a book written about it. Right. I don't know if you still get it. You can probably find it on um, uh, you know, Amazon or eBay or something like that. But uh, the study that was done on the soldier determined that uh, the heel of his shoe appeared to be the type of heel that was manufactured in North Carolina. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> That's like the best thing That's we have. pretty incredible. <laughs> um, is the Rose Farm a private residence now on the battlefield? No, it is owned by the National Park Service, yeah. although um, a lot of the residences on the battlefield or the farms of the battlefield are used by park rangers uh, for housing. I should um, say the Rose Farm, though, the reason that's a good question, it was privately owned until like 1988. Wow. That's amazing. I didn't the know house. that. Wow. Uh, Bob Velke, our friend, is asking, have we seen the inventory of personal property taken from the unknown soldiers at the National Cemetery? No. Uh, do we have it or who has it? Um, um, I have uh, several friends that, uh, Battlefield Tour Guides, obviously, that have like made it their lives to try to find these boxes of this personal stuff. And uh, um, uh, one gentleman, Roy Frampton, uh, really searched the National Archive records. And I, I think um, Ed Guy and Jim Klaus as well gave it their best. And maybe Fred Harthorn, to name a few people who have attempted the answer to this question. And what he's talking about is that in the booklet that was printed by the Soldiers National Cemetery Committee, they have a list in the back of unknown soldiers, right. and they mention items that were found with the soldiers. And apparently... In the original uh, cemetery gatehouse, there was a place where you went to, and they had these boxes of the items that were from the unknown soldiers in the cemetery. So people could open them up, look, if they saw a photograph of themselves, a wife, and oh, that's my husband. You know, they could identify the soldier uh, in that, using that. Right, means. right, great. Uh, just a couple more questions. Books related to the civilians of Gettysburg. Someone's mentioning, um, and temper your response, um, <laughs> whether the book called The Smoke Cleared at Gettysburg by Sheldon is a good representation of what the civilians went through. No. <laughs> Don't like that book. I hope it's an old book and the author's not listening. Yeah. I'm uh, not familiar with that book. Yeah. Um, we, we like Lost, Margaret Crichton's yeah. book, The Colors of yeah. Courage. We think that's a very good book and we Jerry recommend Bennett, it. Jerry Bennett, a good friend yeah. of the Adams County Historical Society. Wonderful Jerry book. Bennett, the Days of Uncertainty and Dread. Right. It's a really good book. Now, uh, when the smoke cleared at Gettysburg, it's mostly about the aftermath of the battle. Right. And I always say this, too. The best book on the battle of Gettysburg is the one you like. <laughs> that's good. You know what I mean? If you think it's good and, and for you Tim, like it, that would be, hey, that's great. That's great. <laughs> for Tim, that would be no book, I think. 
<laughs> yeah, I, I, don't, don't ask me what I learned. Yes, yep. Um, very good. So um, I think that answers a lot of the questions related to the battle. We just have a couple about post-battle events, and then we'll wrap it up. Somebody said they'll keep us here all night if we keep going. So I, I'm glad that everybody's enjoying the program. We still have over 100 people watching, so I guess we're not boring anybody to tears yet. Um, the uh, Someone's asking about the 1913 reunion. Um, how many actual Battle of Gettysburg veterans showed up to these reunions? Um, well, I don't think we know how many Battle of Gettysburg veterans were at the 1913 reunion. I think the estimates of the 1913 reunion are 40,000 veterans. Now, uh, I remember a good friend of mine, Jim Klaus, um, he came across the fact that at the state of Pennsylvania, at the PHMC, Pennsylvania Museum and Historical Commission Archives, they had the registration book of the veterans at the 1913 reunion. And we looked on the map that they had, the full-time map that showed like the reunion tents, and you could see the registration tent <laughs> on the map. So we went there, he was all excited, uh, got the book out, and I think it had maybe 2,000 signatures in it. So um, people didn't go to the registration tent and register <laughs> in the book. And it asked you what unit you were in. So um, I don't remember how many guys he came up with throughout the battle. But Jim Klaus also, in Suitland, Maryland, at National Archives 2, um, and I think it's still, it's either there or they moved it to College Park, these records. It's probably in College Park now. They have the 1913, uh, uh, 1938 reunion records. And they ask, they offered to pay the expenses of any veteran that was alive that wanted to attend the ceremony. And 8,000 veterans were still alive. So they sent 8,000 invitations to these various veterans collecting pensions. And they received uh, notifications back. And on that, it did ask what unit they were in. And if I'm not mistaken, and maybe Jim will see this at some point, um, I think he came up with like 120 veterans that were at the Battle of Gettysburg that attended that ceremony out of the 2,000 veterans in attendance. Oh, that's very good. Yeah. Someone else asking about the best source of photos of the 1913 reunion. Probably us. Uh, we have quite a few photos of the 1913 yeah. reunion, as well as the 1938 reunion, uh, which there were fewer Civil War vets at that, and I think very few that actually were from the Battle of yeah. Gettysburg. Um, but uh, actually, I think Bob Velke, our friend watching, pointed out 1913 was 53,407, according to the, the record. So Bob, Bob is a great data yeah. guy, isn't he? Now, how did they That's count that wonderful. if nobody registered? That's true. <laughs> <laughs> no cameras, no crowd cameras, that's for sure. Um, wonderful. Um, well, the only other question I see, we've got one more modern question from our good friend Ron Crablin. Um, in 1919, the Annie Warner Hospital, our get local Gettysburg Hospital, had 12 auxiliary divisions to raise funds. He's asking, one was from Guernsey in Adams County, and he's wondering what the heck Guernsey was. <laughs> well, Guernsey is one of those towns that pops up along uh, the Gettysburg-Harrisburg Railroad that was laid out in 1884 between Gettysburg and uh, Harrisburg. And they laid out this railroad, and uh, one of the major reasons was to provide a better route for tourists to get into Gettysburg from the north, because before that they had to ride down around through York and down to... Um, uh, you know, here over Junction, uh, across the over to Gettysburg. And so this has opened up as a tourist railroad, but they also opened up railroad stops along it through northern Adams County. And I should mention that these railroad stops in northern Adams County really spurred the drive that made Adams County the national market for apples and fruit at that time. But Guernsey was a stop along that railroad in uh, Butler Township. And um, there's a Guernsey Road. Um, uh, those of you from Biggerville probably remember there was a Guernsey Bridge at one time that went over uh, the uh, walking uh, bridge. It went over uh, the railroad for many years. I, I believe the name of the town Guernsey was called because, uh, and forgive me if I don't remember his name, I think Cyrus Greist, uh, that was his favorite type of cow, the Guernsey cow. <laughs> and so they named the railroad stop after him. There's some obscure knowledge. Next time you visit Gettysburg or if you're a local, drive up to, to Guernsey. Um, yeah, one. so I think we're going to end. I have one quick question um, about the park files. 
um, Park National Park Service files that they've collected on various units and farms. Um, we do have digital copies of those at the Historical Society, but I think other than there and maybe the guide, Nash, the licensed guide library, those are the only places you can get them. So you'll probably have to wait till we re reopen to see that. Um, uh, somebody, someone, asked, somebody asked me a question okay. on, the, on yeah, go ahead. Facebook. Um, uh, somebody asked, uh, what is the most humorous thing or research uh, topic <laughs> okay. that I've gotten over the years? And I have to say, it's happened to me. It always humors me very greatly. And I'm sure that some of this is at the expense of the patron. But I think it's happened to me four times that someone has come to me and said, hey, I have this letter written by Abraham Lincoln why he was in Gettysburg. Two times it happened on the phone where they called me, and two times they brought it in to show it to me. <laughs> and of course, Gettysburg, November 19th, 1863, four score and seven years ago. <laughs> and all four times, it was a facsimile of the address. So I don't know when they started making these uh, life, you know, these facsimiles in the 1960s when I came to Gettysburg for the first time, yeah. I got one. <laughs> I think they've been made and sold around town since the 1920s. Stop making these things look really old because people are falling for it. Well, I don't think they look really old. But <laughs> we've had to really let some people down about that, you know. But some people refuse to believe us when we try to tell them. But, uh, yep, we've we've had quite a few of, um, facsimiles of the Gettysburg Address uh, um, who, you know, people thought they were, they were legitimate. Um, the last question, actually, uh, well, we got one more. Um, I promise we won't go too much longer. Um, someone's asking, um, if it's okay to look for relics on non-federal land. The answer is yes, but of course you do need permission of the property sure. owner. Um, sure. there's no problem with yeah. looking on private land as long as you have, uh, the property owner's permission. And a lot of people enjoy it. It's a very, uh, fun and interesting hobby that people have. Yeah, absolutely. And the very last question, I will cut it off after this one. Um, uh, someone uh, asked early on, um, and they said they were curious about the fighting on July 4th, the skirmishing that took place the day after the battle. Um, and if you could talk just briefly about what that consisted of and um, and, and uh, why there isn't really a lot written about well, it. I just think that when you, know, when you see books on the Battle of Gettysburg and we have that massive Pickett's Charge, and, you know, the person writing the book is looking for an ending for their book. That seems like a really logical place to end it right there after the charge. Sometimes the cavalry action that occurred on uh, the evening of July 3rd near Big Round Top doesn't get any attention in books on the battle. But on July 4th, the Southern Army pulled out of the town, but they maintained their position along Seminary Ridge. And there were uh, some units that fought across the field of Pickett's Charge in heavy skirmish action on July 4th. On the, uh, July 4th, the Union Army reoccupied the town. There was a violent sharpshooter action at the edge of the town, on western edge of the town, northern edge of the town on uh, the 4th of July. And, of course, the Southern Army start their retreat on the 4th of July. So there are a number of people that are killed or wounded um, on that day of the battle. So, you know, maybe sometimes we should count the 4th of July as part of the battle, but we tend not to. That's great. Well, thank you, Tim. And thank you all for your wonderful questions. Probably over a hundred questions all told. I tried to get all of them. If we missed anything, I, I apologize. We, we did our best and uh, uh, we did run a little over. So I apologize too for that. If, uh, um, if uh, we inconvenienced you at all with that. But thank you so much for tuning in. Um, I'm Andrew Dalton. I'm the executive director of the Adams County Historical Society. Uh, we're on our, our porch here. Uh, we are closed to the public for the time being, but uh, uh, we, we are working hard and, and trying to uh, continue to bring content to you and do these programs every week. So if you enjoyed tonight's program and you haven't already done so, I hope you'll, you'll hit the donate button and, um, and support our work to keep all this incredible history safe, preserved, and to continue to present it um, to uh, all of our, our friends out there. So I hope everybody's safe and, and healthy, and we're going to be back with you next Thursday at 7 p.m. Um, and uh, thanks again for spending your time with us this evening.